Hey, everybody. I, um, I want to thank God so much for uh, just uh, all the ways that he proves his faithfulness to us. You know, you guys may not know what goes on behind the scenes for speakers, but you get like stomach aches, you have like uh, residual sicknesses from your kids, um, and all these things are going on. And God's been so faithful to just care for me and to surround me with people who have prayed for me, who've encouraged me, um, and I'm grateful for that. Also, a big shout out to all the AV people who've been uh, serving us. You guys give them a hand. <clears throat> um, some of you guys are probably asking, like, like, why in the world is a director of mobilization and candidacy speaking at an evangelism conference? I'm actually wondering the same thing. Where, where's Matt? Can we, Matt, why am I here? <laughs> no, um, actually, one day I was, um, I was tweeting about something that I had been observing in my um, experience since graduating from ORU, um, and Matt said, well, hey, look, let's talk about that. I really think there's something in that. And so um, we talked on the phone, and I said, um, Matt, I'm observing something that I like to call, I guess, fragmented evangelism. Um, fragmented evangelism is basically where someone feels like um, they are only called to a certain type of evangelism, and they are justified, um, or they, are, they are given permission to not engage in other types of evangelism. I've seen this most often in the area of evangelizing to strangers. So many people have kind of said, well, you know what? I, have, uh, I do friendship evangelism, or I do relationship evangelism, where you know, I hang out with my family, I'm a great moral example around my friends, but don't ask me to get involved in witnessing the strangers because that's not really my cup of tea. So you see this fragmentation um, instead of um, this comprehensive evangelism where people basically say, um, I don't want to be open and available to God for everything, I'll just do my part and let those other guys do their part. Um, and so just a little bit about myself, when I um, became a believer at a church called Green Forest Community Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church in Decatur, Georgia, I was on fire. I would share the gospel with everybody, um, just really passionate about the Lord. Went to Morehouse College, and I would like share the gospel with everybody, anything that moved. Um, I was a little bit too zealous, so like one thing I did is I took this uh, little flyer, and I put it on the back of the toilet stall, and it said, um, um, the strain and pain you're going through now is nothing compared to where you might end up if you don't know Jesus, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying do that, okay? So I'm not saying do that. But that's how passionate I was for Jesus. Everybody had to know Jesus. I stepped on a lot of toes. I was a little bit offensive at times. But my point is, I saw it as essential to my um, faith that I had to be involved in sharing the gospel with strangers. Um, and, and what happened is um, I went to Old Roberts University. Uh, while I was there, I got involved in a ministry called Warriors for Christ. We'd be out on the streets Friday nights witnessing, sharing the gospel with people. Um, got involved in ORU missions, going overseas, doing door-to-door -door stuff, praying for people who were sick. Um, I'd be on an airplane flying to and from school, and I'd just be waiting. Who's going to sit next to me on this plane where I can have a spiritual conversation and, and just listen to see where God is at work in their life? And this passion that I was experiencing, I assumed was normal, right? I mean, isn't that what people do when they love Jesus? Don't they want to talk about him to anyone and everyone, regardless of whether or not they know them? Um, it wasn't until I graduated um, from ORU that I began to notice that that was the exception and not the norm. Uh, I was invited to be a part of a, um, of a, um, uh, a, a young, like a, a, a trip for teenage guys uh, to go to Disney World. And so I was a chaperone. And one day we were all seated in the lobby. There were about 50 guys. We're seated in the lobby. And these three Hispanic young ladies came up to me. And uh, we start talking because I like to pr practice my Spanish, you know. Um, and I began to share the gospel with them in Spanish. And one of the other chaperones observed what was taking place and told the main leader of the group what I was doing. And the main leader's response was, that's because Richard is a real Christian. Now, that actually, in some ways, was affirming, but it was also very troubling because it was stated as though I was the exception and not the norm. There was no expectation of other people to do the same thing because that's what Richard does. Um, and I began to see that as I would share testimonies with friends or testimonies with groups of people. Guess what God did this weekend? Guess what? And people would say, oh, wow, that's great, you know? And, and that bothers me because what we think is, obviously certain people do have uh, an easier time maybe or they're more anointed, if you will, to do certain things, but it doesn't dismiss the rest of us from engaging in, in evangelism among strangers. Amen? So I ended up uh, joining a sending agency, and my job is to help recruit missionaries as well as to help screen them. And I began to notice on this one particular question on the application, 
It says, explain your understanding of evangelism and your confidence in leading a person into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so often, I would get the exact same answer. Well, I really don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel with strangers, but I do live as a positive example around my family and my friends and my community. So people have kind of assumed, because of this fragmentation, that it is okay for them to have a passive friendship evangel evangelism and never ever engage in, uh, in stranger evangel evangelism, if you will. Um, so there are basically four reasons why I think, and you could come up with many, many more if we were to sit around, but I think there are four reasons why many people are so afraid uh, or, or, or reticent or hesitant to get involved in witnessing to strangers. Um, the first thing is fear, which I already alluded to. There are some people who are terrified of talking with strangers. I mean, you would rather read a book than talk to a stranger, right? <laughs> the introverts, you guys know that, right? Um, for me, strangers are like treasure chests. Who is this person? Do we have any friends in common? I wonder if we do some of the same activities together. I wonder what will happen as a result of us talking together. So that's me. But for some of you, it is absolutely terrifying to even introduce yourself to a person. So you're not even going to share the gospel with them. The second thing I would say is, um, is because we have this sense of inadequacy. We have this sense that we don't know the right techniques. What is step A, step B, step C? How do I pray in such a way that the Holy Spirit falls on them and they fall backwards and they look up and say, what must I do to be saved? We assume that there's a technique to it. And so we feel inadequate because we don't think we have the right, uh, the right uh, technique. The other thing with inadequacy is that I'm really appreciative of things like Myers-Briggs and Strength Finder and, uh, and knowing what our specialization should be. But those things um, can be a crutch or they can, be, they can actually be a hindrance to us being available to God to be used in whatever way he chooses. So what we say is, God, I'm an ISTJ. And because I'm an ISTJ, you know that sharing the gospel with strangers is absolutely difficult for me. So we focus on what is supposed to be, I mean, it's a strength, but we, it turns into a weakness because we tell God how he can and can't use us. It's similar to Moses. It's similar to Gideon. Um, but look at what happens in the book of Acts. The disciples are sharing the faith with such boldness that people comment and say, these guys are unlearned guys. These guys are regular old guys, and they're preaching with such boldness and power. So what would happen if you yielded yourself to the Spirit of God, and he took you, the shy one, the introverted one, the unskilled one, the one who doesn't know what to say or do, and he uses you for his glory? That testimony is more powerful than me, the extrovert, the ESFJ, who wants to hug everybody and hear your story, right? Okay, everyone in the world knows who my personality type is now. Um, the third thing is embarrassment. Um, we have seen so many believers who have uh, preached the gospel in a condescending and a rude and a harsh way, and we know that that has kind of um, made the rest of us look bad. So we kind of figure, if I don't, like, don't want to be like that, so I just, I'm not even going to get involved in that because I don't want to fuel their perception of what, of what Christians might be like. And the last thing uh, is just belief. Um, some of us, whether we agree, whether we would be honest with ourselves or not, we believe in like a universalism where we think, who am I to bother a person? They look happy. Um, they have a great life ahead of them. Who cares if they believe what they believe? Who am I to, you know, um, push my beliefs on them? And so we won't engage them. Uh, another thing about belief is some people think that sharing the gospel with someone is such an intimate thing that it should, be never, it should never be done with a stranger. So they would say, like, talking about someone's eternal uh, destination is like having a conversation about sex. Like, how's your sex life? Right? Wouldn't that be awkward? Well, some people say that's what a spiritual conversation is like. It falls into that category. So it's rude for strangers to do that. Um, now, so I myself have been, the embarrassment thing has kind of hit me. There have been times when I've been great at forming relationships. I know their family's name. I know, like, where they went to school. I know even what their weaknesses are. But there's that embarrassment saying, I don't want to be labeled in as one of those Bible-thumping, chandelier-swinging Christians. And so, therefore, I kind of get a little gun-shy and won't take the gospel across the bridge that God has formed. And um, I remember having a dream, a real dream, uh, I um, was walking in a hotel room, uh, down a hallway in a hotel, and Oral Roberts pops out of the elevator. He didn't walk through the doors, but, but the doors open, all right? And Oral Roberts lays hands on me, and I fall out, you know? Um, and when I look up, he points in my face, and he says, Richard, when you're, when you're witnessing the people and you're building relationships, get to the main point. 
I'll never forget that because I didn't want to hurt people's feelings. I didn't want to, you know, fuel people's perceptions of what Christians were like, you know, agenda-driven, you know, condescending, whatever, whatever. And so I just wanted to build a friendship but not take the gospel across. Now, in the final uh, minutes that are remaining, um, what can we do to address some of those things? First of all, let me just say that friendship, evangelism, or sharing the gospel in the context of relationships is extremely important. All the statistics would say that most people come to faith through um, family and friends and through coworkers and through those types of relationships. So I don't want to dismiss that, but I would say don't have a passive faith where you just say they're going to watch me and they're going to all of a sudden want to be a believer without me saying anything. I don't think that's the case. Um, so what can we do? Um, just a couple of things. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Trevin Wax, for this one. Repent! <laughs> you know, I think it's so important that, um, that we repent and that we recognize that, um, that we need to have a change of heart where we realize that God can work through us. Don't tell God what he can and can't do through you because of your personality type or your skill set. So repent. Change your attitude. Um, what do you want to change your perspective to? Two things related to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is already at work in that person. You know, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of its sin. So when you, when you see a person from a distance, I mean, you know, don't just... I don't suggest you walk up to everybody and share the gospel. I mean, you know, like, be a little discerning. You know what I mean? Um, but when you do see that person, God, where are you already at work in that person? Just like the Blackaby book, God is already at work there. Let me go see where God is at work and join him there. So it's a bit arrogant of us to think that evangelism is all about us and our carefully crafted presentation. Evangelism is about us partnering with God in this supernatural event of him drawing the world to himself. And we're just one actor in the whole process. Um, and, um, and then the other thing is that the Holy Spirit empowers us. I know that there are all kinds of views here about what the Holy Spirit can and can't do in 2015. But let me tell you that the Holy Spirit was given. One of the many reasons he was given was to empower believers for the sake of witness. Now, the Bible says that. You can do with that whatever you want to do with it. But I will tell you, I have seen God give me confidence in situations where I was absolutely had no confidence. I've seen God use me in a healing context when I don't have any magical fingertips. I've seen God uh, use me to give me words of wisdom or words of knowledge or those kinds of things. The Holy Spirit can empower you to be his witness in any given situation at any given time, but don't limit him and miss out on the privilege of letting him use you. Amen? Um, other thing is, is, is do it in a relational way. Be relational in the way that you do it. I know these folks are strangers, but do what you can to make them less, feel less strange. Build a relationship in the little time that you have. Um, Keith Wheeler, um, one of the guys who carries a cross around the world, his evangelism training for us at ORU, one particular session he gave, he said, um, did you remember their name? What's the color of their eyes? And did you make them smile or dry their tears? That's relational. It's not about all the things that I can say or, or do. Does that make sense? Um, and then the final thing is, um, is sometimes you can go with somebody who feels a little more confident. Uh, maybe you want to go with someone like me because I like to talk to everybody. So you can just observe what I do. Um, and when you do things more, I mean like standing up here and speaking to an audience of people, that, that's like, that can make you really nervous. But when you do these things more and more and more, you kind of, you get a little more comfortable. It doesn't mean you don't rely on God. It just means you get a little more comfortable with it. And if you don't have any exposure to sharing the gospel with strangers, I'd encourage you to find somebody who can take you out. Um, and you guys can go to a mall or go somewhere and just pray and say, God, is there anyone um, in whose life you're working in, in a way right now that they would be ready and receptive to a, to a, a presentation of the gospel? Could you guys do that? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And I want to say this to all of, all of us on the stage. Um, I hate hypocrisy in myself, and I hate it in others. So I guarantee you, what, what I'm telling you to do, I'll have to go back home, get on my knees and say, God, I've got to do this. And so to, to all of us who call ourselves um, evangelists, who stand on big stages and preach in front of people, but we're not sharing the gospel with strangers, same thing to you. It's fragmented evangelism. You can't pick and choose. Be available at all times. Amen? Um, so I want to give you one thing. In the last 26 seconds I have... I would like for you, after this message, to text someone who will hold you accountable to respond to this message. I don't want to, like, entertain you and tell you a lot of stuff and you take notes and do nothing about it. I would like for you to text somebody who can hold you accountable to do exactly what we've talked about today. Can you do that? 
All right, amen. Um, I'm going to uh, yield the stage to my good friend and my dear sister, Laurie Nichols, and I believe that what she has to sh uh, share will go nicely with what we've already talked about today. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>